Table of Contents Title Page Copyright Forward Dedication Introduction Chapter 1, A Miracle Service Chapter 2, The Legend Begins Chapter 3, Defining Moments Chapter 4, The Call of God Chapter 5, The Day Catherine Coleman Died Chapter 6, The First Miracle Chapter 7, Her Best Friend Chapter 8, The Glory Belongs to God Appendix I, A Biographical Chronology Appendix 2, Messages by Catherine Coleman about the author scripture quotations marked, NIV, are from the Holy Bible, New International Version Registered Trademark. NIV Registered Trademark, Copyright 1973, 1978, 1984 by the International Bible Society. Used by permission of Zondervan. All rights reserved. Scripture quotations marked, KJV are taken from the King James Verion of the Holy Bible. Scripture quotations marked, NKJV, are taken from the New King James Version, copyright 1979, 1980, 1982, 1984 by Thomas Nelson, incorporated used by permission. All rights reserved. The Catherine Coleman Foundation photos are used by P. Ermis Sion. We would like to express our appreciation to the Catherine Coleman Foundation, PO Box 3 Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 15230, for their permission to use excerpts from sermons by Catherine Coleman and photographs of her. Catherine Coleman, A Spiritual Biography of God's Miracle Worker Roberts Liard and Ministries PO Box 2989, Sarasota, Florida, 34230 Phone, 941-373. 3883 www.robearthlyardon.comisbn 978-0-88368-837-3 ebook ISBN 13 978-1-60374-763-9 produced in the United States of America copyright 1990 2005 by Roberts Liard and Whitaker House 1030 Hunt Valley Circle New Kensington Pennsylvania 15068 com Library of Congress cataloging in publication data Liard and Roberts Catherine Coleman a Spiritual Biography of God's Miracle Worker slash Roberts Liard and Dash Rev and Updated Ed. P. Centimeter Summary, Biography of Catherine Coleman's Life Highlighting Major Events and What She Learned from Them, with Appendix of Her Teachings Dash Provided by Publisher. Includes Bibliographical References and Index. ISBN 13. 978-0-88368-837-3, Trade PBK. ALK Paper, ISBN 10-0-88368-837-9, Trade PBK, ALK Paper, 1. Coleman, Catherine. 2. Evangelists United States Biography. 3. Healers United States Bio-G Rap H.Y. I. Title. BV 3785.K84 L53 2005 269.2092 DC 22200-502-6970 No part of this book may be reproduced or transmitted in any form or by any means, electronic or mechanical including photocopying, recording, or by any information storage and retrieval system without permission in writing from the publisher. Please direct your inquiries to P. Ermis Sions at ITOR at whatakerhouse.com. This book has been digitally produced in a standard specification in order to ensure its availability. Forward Matthew 22:14 says, For many are called, but few are chosen, not because God is a respecter of persons, but because few are willing to pay the price of full surrender and be yielded vessels for the Master's use. You will read in the pages of this biography how Catherine Coleman's spiritual journey took her one Saturday afternoon to a dead-end street where she died to self, died to the flesh, and surrendered unto him all there was of her, becoming a vessel the Holy Spirit could mightily use for the glory of God. And mightily used she was. Catherine Coleman was a woman who believed in miracles because she believed in God. And she believed in a big God with whom all things are possible, a God who has the answer to every need in everyone's life, no matter what those needs may be. Throughout her years of ministry, 
thousands were healed during the services by the power of the Holy Spirit and she was ever so careful never to take the glory, always emphasizing, Catherine Coleman has nothing to do with the healing of sick bodies. She often acknowledged, I have no healing power. It's the power of God that does the healing. The only part I have is making Jesus real to the hearts of men and women. She was uncompromisingly sold out to God, loved him with all of her heart, served him with all of her being, and had a tremendous burden for souls. When asked what she regarded as the ultimate goal of her ministry, she replied without hesitation, My purpose is the salvation of souls. Divine healing is secondary to the transformation of a life. Catherine Coleman had a heart of love and compassion for others and stated often, Love is something you do, you can't love without doing and giving. She also said, Helping people is the most rewarding thing in the world. You do not have to be a Catherine Coleman to help people. That should be the goal of every Christian we were all born to serve. You will be blessed and challenged as you read this spiritual biography of the life and ministry of Catherine Coleman. Carol Gray, Executive Director the Catherine Coleman Foundation dedication behind every ministry is the support team that holds up the hands of the minister, as Aaron and her did for Moses in Exodus 17:12. I would like to express my appreciation and thanks to those people who loyally served Catherine Coleman and assisted her throughout the decades of her ministry. Her anointing could not have influenced the world to the vast extent that it has without those people, who so faithfully and tirelessly supported her. Roberts liared an introduction I believe in miracles. After attending a Catherine Coleman miracle service, thousands of people would leave saying, I believe in miracles, too. What people experienced during her meetings was extraordinary beyond human comprehension. From the time I attended my first Catherine Coleman service as a young boy, I have been fascinated by her life and ministry. My purpose in writing this book is not to retell the story of her natural life, but to draw some spiritual lessons from her life. More than a biography, this is an observation of her personal odyssey and an examination of the many things that were occurring in the spiritual realm during her time. Miss Coleman was one of the key players in God's plan for his 20th century church. In a literal sense of the word, she was a forerunner of the church of the future. There was a prophetic tone in her ministry that showed what the church would be like in times to come. Catherine Coleman laid a world foundation for the workings of the Holy Spirit. Her ministry shifted the focus of the body of Christ from the supernatural gifts manifested in the Pentecostal movement back to the giver of the gifts, the Holy Spirit. She was unique, though she called herself ordinary. The word unique is overused and misused today, but who else in modern times was like Catherine Coleman? Many have tried to imitate her voice and theatrical mannerisms but have failed. Many have tried to translate the anointing that was on her into techniques and methods but have not achieved it. Those attempting to copy her have had no power, no anointing, and nowhere near the lasting impact and legacy of Catherine Coleman. Miss Coleman was a woman of great humility who was careful to give God all of the glory for everything that occurred in her life and ministry. She stated consistently that the healings that occurred through her ministry were not her doing but the work of God. People came forward in her meetings to testify of their healing, not to receive healing. Catherine Coleman was a woman so thoroughly dependent and yielded to the Lordship of Jesus Christ that the Holy Spirit had liberty to do through her as he desired. The miraculous was so evident in her meetings that even the worst skeptic would leave in bewilderment even more, many would leave believing that Jesus does still perform miracles. Such was the visible proof that God did indeed work powerfully through his handmaiden, Catherine Johanna Coleman. I thank God for Catherine Coleman, an example of one who was unafraid to pay the price to walk in his service. I am grateful for the lessons I have learned through her life, and I want to share some of those lessons in this book many of them in her own woe rds. May those called to minister in this hour walk the road that Catherine Coleman helped pave, the road of the miraculous. Roberts Liard and Chapter 1 A Miracle Service Why Aren't They All Healed? The tall, attractive woman in a flowing chiffon gown poises motionless at the bottom of four steps that lead up to a door. At some internal cue, she glides up the steps, stopping on the last one. She walks to the door and, 
as she has done countless times before, rests her hand on the black doorknob. There, she dies a thousand deaths, something she does every time before walking through that door. On the other side of the door, a sea of people are anxiously anticipating the arrival of Catherine Coleman. Many are in great pain. Some, in wheelchairs or on stretchers, made Herculean efforts to be there. Others came from nearly impossible distances, just to be in the presence of this woman who believes so powerfully in God's miracles. Miss Coleman knows that without yielding to the Holy Spirit in many deaths to self, she prevents him from moving freely through her to heal the people waiting for her on the other side of that door. She turns the knob, billows out, and makes her way to center stage, Carnegie Hall. A spiritual current surges through the people seated in the cavernous auditorium. There, facing her, are people from all races, creeds, and religions. They have come from all over the world seeking help. They have heard that in the presence of Catherine Coleman, the sick are healed including many whom medical science has given up on. They are without hope, virtually sentenced to die by their conditions or diseases. Miss Coleman is well aware that she cannot heal a single one of the these people. In fact, she never claimed to heal anyone. She depends on the unseen source of her life, her best friend, the Holy Spirit. Miss Coleman's face breaks into a wide smile as she greets the vast sea of people. She flows across the stage, sharing from her heart the truth that she knows so well about the one whom she trusts beyond all human understanding. Pointing toward the main floor, she declares, their asthma is being healed. I see the Holy Spirit in this area of the auditorium, she exclaims and points to the wheelchair area. Tears begin to trickle down her cheeks as she looks at the upper balcony and states, up there, someone is being healed of sugar diabetes. Suddenly, it's happening all over the building. People are rising from wheelchairs and from seats, amazed and inexpressibly happy. Braces are discarded. Wheelchairs are abandoned. Hearing aids are removed forever. They are healed. Up on stage they go, to stand in front of the woman who has summoned them, the woman who believes in miracles. What happened to you, she asks one, with genuine enthusiasm and curiosity. They explain their miraculous healing. How do you know, she prompts, gently urging them to publicly proclaim the healing. Those in Miss Coleman's vicinity begin to fall backward under the power of the Holy Spirit, while thousands in the auditorium cry and laugh with the healed. Several hours later, the service concludes. There on the stage stands Miss Coleman, weeping as the people leave the building. But why is she crying after such a powerful and beautiful service? It is because she saw some who were still in wheelchairs being pushed outside to be taken home. Those poor souls were not healed. As tears stream down her face, she asks, why, even more disappointed than those who went away unhealed. She steps off of the platform, walks back through the door and down the four steps, wondering whether or not she had fully yielded to the Holy Spirit that night. All of her life, Catherine Coleman will question whether she could have better cooperated with the Holy Spirit, even though she yielded and cooperated to a degree few ministers and church leaders have ever achieved. With tears of compassion flowing down her face, she asks God the question that will remain unanswered throughout her life, why weren't they all healed? The touch of her anointing the first time I ever saw Catherine Coleman I was seven years old. The Civic Center Auditorium in Tulsa, Oklahoma, was already packed, so we had to sit on the third floor of the center and listen to her through an intercom system. I remember her deep, melodious voice and the unusual manner in which she spoke, gentle and dancing, yet strong and commanding. Toward the end of the service, as people began to leave, we slipped down into the auditorium. I stood there, watching Miss Coleman up on the stage as the musicians played the last song of the service. I don't recall exactly what she was saying, but hundreds of people were pressing toward the platform, just to get near her, to touch her, to shake her hand. That sight of her, the immense crowds, the packed auditorium, the crying and laughing people, will forever be imprinted in my memory. Whenever Miss Coleman departed from the building after her services, 
the ushers would band together and lock arms to create a circle of protection around her, because people would wait outside the building after services so they could try to touch her or grab a piece of her clothing, hoping for her anointing to rub off on them. People would often become quite aggressive in their attempts to get close to her. The second time Catherine Coleman came to Tulsa, I was there to see her again. She spoke at the Mavi Center on the Oral Roberts University campus. The building was jammed to its capacity of 12,000. My mother was part of the special choir for the service and had taken part in a rehearsal with Miss Coleman a few weeks earlier, so my family had been talking of this meeting for a while. I had often spoken with friends about the miracles that took place in Miss Coleman's services. Long before she even entered the building, an expectancy had built up in the people because of the testimonies of the miracles and the moving of the Holy Spirit that preceded her, and they were anxious to receive from God and hear what He was going to reveal. The church my family attended had a special section reserved in the balcony. From where we sat, Miss Coleman looked like a white speck. The auditorium was dark. A lone spotlight illuminated her. She wore her trademark flowing, white dress. Although she was a tall woman, from way up in the balcony, she looked tiny. She greeted everyone in that deep, melodious voice. I don't recall much about that particular sermon but I do remember her weeping. Then, as she seemed to be concluding her message, she suddenly began to speak words of knowledge and to call people out. Several nuns in wheelchairs rose up and, along with some other people, walked unhindered to the stage. It was an incredible healing service. Four weeks afterward, people were ecstatic about the meeting. There was talk of those who were healed and how miraculously God had moved. This occurred in every one of Catherine Coleman's services. The third time Catherine Coleman came to Tulsa, I was not able to attend. However, my mother was again part of the choir and was able to take my grandmother. They arrived early at the Mavi Center so they could get close enough to see Miss Coleman clearly. What my grandmother remembers most about Catherine Coleman that night was her white gown. What she remembers most about the service was the sight of crippled people suddenly walking. When Miss Coleman was calling out sicknesses and diseases as healed, my grandmother heard a metallic rustling noise behind her. When she turned around, she realized that the noise was the sound of people leaving their wheelchairs. So many people got up and left their wheelchairs I would estimate at least 10 or 15, she told me. Those kinds of miracles cannot be understood with the natural mind. The second most vivid thing my grandmother remembered about that service was that everyone Catherine Coleman came close to or touched was slain in the spirit and fell backwards under his power. At times, even ushers were affected by the power of the Holy Spirit and fell in the aisles. Miss Coleman referred to her sermons as heart-to-heart -heart talks, in which she would share her inner thoughts and the impress ions of her spirit, as well as truths from the Bible. Those talks brought her hearers into a closer knowledge of the realm of the spirit, where she walked. That place was such a reality to her that she was able to make it real to those who heard her with the listening ears of the spirit. During a Catherine Coleman service, one could feel the continual moving of the power of the Holy Spirit in a tangible way throughout the service, from beginning to end. Becoming aware of that realm brought people to a realization that they too could experience His power, and they eagerly reached out for the Holy Spirit, which Miss Coleman seemed to usher into her P. Residential N.C.E. After Miss Coleman talked for some time, the congregation would suddenly be in unity with her, and the miracles would begin. It was the hungering of the people for the kind of relationship she had with the Holy Spirit that brought the miracles to them. I believe the day will come when we will operate in that same fashion, in a greater demonstration of the miraculous than any we have seen since the great days of Catherine Coleman. A historic day in church history on July 4, 1948, Catherine Coleman held her first miracle service at Carnegie Hall in Pittsburgh. Her services continued there for 20 years. I believe they might just be the most amazing services since the days of the Apostles. Her services began with music. Catherine always knew the value of music in bringing a crowd into unity of spirit. She always used only the best musicians, partly because she enjoyed music so much, 
but mainly because she felt that anything done for the Lord ought to be the absolute best. Jimmy Miller, a pianist at People's Church, a large church on the north side of Pittsburgh, and Charles Beebe, the organist at the same church, were at their instruments in Carnegie Hall for that first service and remained with the Coleman ministry until Catherine passed away decades later. In 1952, Dr. Arthur Metcalf, director of the Mendelssohn Choir in Pittsburgh, joined Miss Coleman's services as choir director and remained with her until he died in 1975, one year to the day before her death. Still later, well-known pianist Dino Kartzonakis joined her ministry and stayed until shortly before her death, and noted baritone Jimmy MacDonald was soloist for her services until she died. From the beginning, Catherine Coleman's services at Carnegie Hall were packed to overflowing. When she was there, the hall was always filled with an indescribable sense of expectancy. The emotions of those attending were deeply affected. However, in some people, emotions were perhaps all that was involved. But the excitement in her meetings, and in any meeting where the presence of the Holy Spirit visits, was not initiated in emotion. In Catherine's services, his presence was manifested in an anointed healing that bathed the soul and body in waves of cleansing. Even those who did not receive bodily healing left the meetings, I believe, with wounds and hurts healed and with the cares of the world at least temporarily left by the wayside. Many of those who came only to scoff or to criticize her were eventually affected themselves as much as those who came expecting to receive. Miss Coleman often talked about the fact that some unbelievers actually received healing and how those incidents challenged her theology. However, it seems that only those who had developed hardened hearts through having resisted the Lord for long periods of time, or those whose minds were programmed against the supernatural, or those who had walked in religious tradition, were unaffected by the atmosphere in her miracle services. They were like boulders or logs that a fresh running stream must flow around. They sat like islands in a lake of healing power and remained unaffected. On the other hand, for various reasons, not all of those who were touched by the presence of the Holy Spirit, or who were aware of the supernatural manifestation, received healing. Interpreting the Holy Spirit The key to understanding the miracle ministry of Catherine Coleman is to understand the way the Holy Spirit chooses to manifest. As a group of people would come into unity with him, he would flow outward across the room like a wave of cleansing, healing water. Any disease or condition that could be moved was washed away. Only the Lord knows the individual reasons why some of the diseases or conditions were not affected by the wave. However, the root cause of lack of healing did not lie with the Holy Spirit He was there for all who could receive. On the other hand, there should never be any condemnation placed on those who were not healed. The cause is between that person and God. That kind of condemnation grieved Catherine Coleman greatly when she saw it as she visited tent meetings of some ministers in the healing revival of the 1940s. Miss Coleman passionately believed that the person who went to a meeting expecting healing and did not receive it needed love, compassion, and prayer, not judging, criticism, or condemnation. The loving attitude of the pastors, family members, friends, and staff might make all the difference in that person receiving healing the next time. Miss Coleman's understanding that she did not know what the Holy Spirit was doing until he told her kept her from putting him in a box or from falling into the trap of formulas and methods. This clear knowledge that without him she could do nothing is what kept her sensitive to the Holy Spirit and walking close enough with him to be able to truly now him. The Holy Spirit used her as an interpreter of what he had done, rather than as a vessel for his healing power. She would explain to people what the Holy Spirit was doing as he told her. Some critics believed that Catherine Coleman deliberately staged her services, however, those who were sensitive to the moving of the Holy Spirit knew who was actually performing the miracles. The presence of the Holy Spirit cannot be faked, staged, or manipulated. Only a genuine desire and respect for his presence will open the door for him to manifest. That desire and reverence is what Catherine Coleman uniquely possessed and was able to communicate to her audiences. As she said many times, she was more than willing to pay the price in order to be totally used by the Lord. Therefore, he was able to manifest more fully in her services than in the services of many other ministers. 
the Holy Spirit is present within every born-again believer. However, his presence was within Catherine Coleman in that full, almost tangible way, whether she was on stage preaching or simply walking down the street. It is possible that she had so dealt with desires of the world and of the flesh that the Holy Spirit had fewer boulders and logs to flow around within her. That does not mean that she was perfect. Until she died, the Lord was still working on her as he is on all of us, but just think how much God could use any of us who would only be willing to give up as much of the life of self as Catherine Coleman did. In the Great Awakening Revival, they called this sanctification. In Philippians 2.12 the Apostle Paul called it working out your own salvation. Paul was not talking about salvation of the Spirit, which brings eternal life, he was talking about areas of the soul and body that retain the old sin nature of man, instead of being like the new nature of the Spirit. The minute we become born again, we become a house divided against our own selves. By sovereign grace, we have the nature of Christ imputed to us, and our dead spirit is brought alive by the impartation of the life of God within us. But our mind, emotions, and body still need to be renewed, conformed to the image of Christ, as explained in Romans 8:29. How do we do this? The same way Catherine Coleman did, give up those things of self that are of the old nature, and allow the Holy Spirit the same authority over our mind, emotions, and body that he has over our spirit. We must stop serving two masters and take up our cross daily and follow Jesus, Matthew 16:24. To take up our cross, or getting on the cross to be crucified and resurrected, means to live in a spirit of not my will, but thine be done, Luke 22:42 NKJV. When we can truly say those words to the Lord, then the Holy Spirit will have free reign in our life. And then, miracles can happen. An atmosphere of praise and worship setting the stage for the appearance of the Holy Spirit cannot be done in natural ways. He will not be stage managed. Catherine Coleman set the stage for him through her own expectancy of his presence. Her dependency on him is what drew him to her. B. Why not knowing exactly how the Holy Spirit was going to move until he had done it, she was more excited and interested than anyone else in her meetings. Some have said she kept a girl-like excitement, but it was actually a childlike faith, coupled with her knowledge of the wonderful things he had done in all of the previous services. Sensitivity to his presence, a childlike faith that he would come and do good things, and past knowledge of his goodness and mercy kept her always walking out onto that stage with an almost electric sense of expectancy. In her book about Catherine Coleman, Helen Hozier described in the following words how Miss Coleman operated, all the things I had been taught about healing I had to unlearn in Catherine's meetings as it was always a new approach, she interviewed each person as if it were the first time she had seen a miracle. She always was excited about the healings and, her excitement, inspired faith. She constantly gave all the glory to God for the healings. She knew she was not a faith healer. The minute she walked on the stage, she created a beautiful atmosphere of praise and worship. This, too, inspired faith. You could feel the presence of many angels who assisted Catherine in her meetings. Only God knows the secret and the full impact of her ministry. Catherine was a born organizer. She was like a spiritual general in the Lord's army. Her ushers were trained, one by one, to handle problems and emergencies. The choir had a special director to prepare them for ministry. Lady advisors were taught to be led by the Holy Spirit. Workers were assigned to a special area, so all the audience could be ministered to. One the direction of Miss Coleman's ministry came from the Holy Spirit. However, her character had been formed during her childhood. Thus, much of her behavior and activities in adulthood were an outgrowth of character traits instilled within her from early on. Just as the lives of twelve ordinary men proved over two thousand years ago that the Lord can raise any willing person up to miraculous heights, so did the unextraordinary childhood of Catherine Coleman prove the same. 1. Asterisk Hozier, Helen Kuiman Catherine Coleman, the life she led, the legacy she left, Old Tappan, Fleming H. Revell, a division of Baker Publishing Group, 1976, p. 
125. Carnegie Hall, April 3, 1975, A Typical Healing Service, A Typical Healing Service, Chapter 2 The legend begins train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Proverbs 22 6, The things we learn in our early, formative years shape the rest of our lives. The imprints of childhood for Catherine Coleman included a permissive father, whose behavior became her standard of measure for those who loved her for the rest of her life, a stern and disciplinarian mother, a lack of formal education, her last schooling was in 10th grade, and a physical appearance during adolescence that might not have been considered appealing by some. Her relationship with her father instilled in Miss Coleman a trust in male authority that allowed her to easily trust God the Father. She drew this conclusion herself in one of her sermons, in the sixth chapter of Matthew, we call it the Lord's Prayer, but it isn't really the Lord's Prayer. It is the prayer the Lord Jesus taught us to pray. If you find it hard to pray, it's because you have never really recognized this wonderful relationship. Do you say it is the most difficult thing in the world for you to come in the presence of your earthly parent and converse with him? Maybe this relationship is so real to me because of my relationship with Papa. If you know me well, you know that of all human beings I have known, my relationship with Papa was the greatest. Oh. I would hang on him. I would love him. Mama would say to me, stop hanging on Papa. Dear me, he was carrying me when my legs were so long they would drag on the pavement. He would no sooner hang up his coat when he got home before he even had a chance to wash his hands and comb his hair I would be hanging on him. He would sit down oh, poor Papa to rest a minute, and I was all over him, my arms around his neck, yakking, chatting, never shutting my mouth, my words coming so fast. And Mama would say, can't you be quiet? Papa's tired. Just sit down and be quiet. I had to tell Papa everything. I knew Papa wanted to know. There wasn't a thing that happened that day that I did not tell Papa. There never was a person easier for me to converse with than Papa. To this day and Papa's been gone a long time there are things that I wish I could run and tell Papa. That's why this relationship with our Heavenly Father is just as real and just as personal. I never memorized anything to tell Papa. It came so spontaneously. And that's the way it is with our Heavenly Father. O oh, you our Father which art in heaven. Matthew 6 9 KJV There must be the knowledge of that relationship between yourself and your Heavenly Father, and when you talk to Him, you must be conscious of His power not only that, but that he's concerned about every detail in that life of yours. To Catherine's father, Joseph Coleman, lived and died without having ever punished her. Her mother, Emma Coleman, was the disciplinarian in the family and overcompensated for her husband's lack of discipline. Miss Coleman said about her parents, he never laid his hands on me. Never. Not once. Mama was the one who disciplined me. I got it down in the basement so the neighbors could not hear me scream. Then, when Papa came home, I would run to him, sit on his lap, and he would take away all the pain. I can never remember, as a child, having my mother show me any affection. Never. Mama was a perfect disciplinarian. But she never once told me she was proud of me or that I did well. Never once. It was Papa who gave me the love and affection. 3. Catherine's father never understood his wife's harsh disciplining of their children. Their only son, Cooley, left home when he was young. An older daughter, Myrtle, married young. When Catherine was 16, she went to live with Myrtle. Whenever Joe tried to interfere with his wife's spankings and frequent criticism of Catherine, Emma would turn on him, too. As the children grew, Joe began spending more time away from home, and he eventually prepared a small room in back of his livery stable, where he frequently spent the night. In the years before Catherine left home, her father began taking her along with him when he went to collect money owed to his stable. The merchants took to calling Catherine Little Joe. 
Joe Coleman was a competent businessman who taught Catherine valuable lessons that would shape her approach to sound business practices in her future ministry. A heritage of thrift and hard work Concordia, Missouri, was settled by German immigrants who began arriving in the late 1830s, although the town was not named until 1865. Miss Coleman's ancestors on both sides of the family were hardy people with tremendous self-discipline. They were hard-working and proud of their heritage. Those traits were among the childhood influences that helped form Catherine Coleman's character. Miss Coleman once said about her hometown, in Concordia, Missouri, if you got up in the morning and you didn't feel good, do you know what those German Lutheran folk did? They went out and worked. My papa would say, well, work it off, honey. Just work it off. And mama used to say, that's all right, honey. You just take the scrub brush and you start scrubbing the sidewalks. It won't be long until you'll feel better. Well, even the thoughts of that scrub brush cured me so fast, it wasn't even funny, for an inclination toward hard work was ingrained in Catherine Coleman throughout her entire life. In her early years, that attitude was reflected in her diligence and perseverance in studying the Bible. But she sometimes wondered what she might have missed through working so hard, it seems that all I have done is preach and pray and work and pray some more, preach some more, and work a little harder. Sometimes I wonder if I have missed anything by not having the same kind of youth that thousands of young people have had. All I've known few people realize it but all of my life has been nothing but hard work. You wonder why I know the word of God as I do. It is because, since I can remember, I've searched the scripture. I've been hungry for the word of God. I have sought understanding of the things that are spiritual. It seems all I have done is pray one constant prayer being constantly conscious of his presence. That is the reason he is as real to me as the next beat of my heart more real to me, very, very often, than one sitting in the room with me. Point five. Emma Walkenhorst married Joseph Coleman on February 11, 1891. Catherine was born to them on May 9, 1907, on their farm five miles from Concordia. Point six. When Catherine was two, Joe sold the family's 160-acre farm and built a large house in town that Catherine always called home. In fact, she loved it so much that she insisted she was born in that house, although she actually was not. She was named, with a different spelling, after her father's mother, Catherine Marie Sarregan Borgstedt, who was subject to epileptic seizures and died a few months before Catherine was born. Point seven. Catherine Marie married John Henry Coleman in 1851. In 1853 they migrated to Concordia. Catherine's grandmother Coleman was noted for her hard work, spinning wool for the entire neighborhood. Catherine's middle name came from her maternal grandmother, Hannah Cooster W. Alkin H.O.R.S.T. A childhood friend described young Catherine in this way, large features, red hair, and freckles. It could not be said of Catherine that she was pretty. She wasn't dainty or appealingly feminine in any sense of the word. She was taller than the rest of our gang, five feet eight, gangly and boyish in build, and her long strides kept the rest of us puffing to keep up with her. Her manner was rather brash instead of ladylike and I dare say she often tried the patience of her mother who was apt to be more rigid and inflexible in her views. As a young girl, Catherine was noted for her independence, self-reliance, and desire to do things her own way. Eight rough waters and deep seas Many things that happen to us in our lives can be beneficial if we will only surrender our own will and desires to God and commit ourselves totally to his use. Because Catherine Coleman died to self and rose back up to serve God, she developed a will that was never broken by her mother's harsh discipline, a personal integrity that extended to her finances in the ministry, and a dedication to God's work that brought her into a rare and unusual relationship with the Holy Spirit. And yet, she stated that she felt like the loneliest person in the world, due to the cost of her commitment to the Lord. When she was only 17, she wrote three wise sentences down in a little red book. Years later, she picked up that little book and reread her words, whether life grinds a man down or polishes him depends on what he's made of. 
a diamond cannot be polished without friction nor man perfected without trials. Great pilots are made in rough waters and deep seas. When I closed the book an hour ago, I turned back the pages of my life. Years have come, and years have gone since the day I wrote those words, and I can bear witness to the fact that every word of it I wrote that day is true. I feel I am the person that I am today because of those deep waters. Not the sunshine in my life, but the storms, the winds, the gales, have polished me. And I'll say it to you without fear of contradiction. It is true. Friend, these things come into your life. It depends on what you're made of whether you permit them to defeat you or whether you use them for the glory of God. I can turn back the pages of my life, and there are certain milestones. I can put my finger on them. I know exactly the day, the hour, when I could have gone down in defeat. I know the places, I know the times, I know the cities, I know the happenings, I know the crises in my life when I could have put up that white flag of defeat. I could have gone down and been defeated by self-pity. I wouldn't be where I am this very hour had it not been for the disappointments, had it not been for the storms, but I made up my mind I wasn't going to be one of those little birds that run for shelter the first time the winds start to blow. Point nine. Catherine Coleman's emphasis on self-reliance may sound contradictory to her emphasis on dying to self. However, she also said, I could not have done it in myself, but when I made the effort, God was there to help me. When you pray, you get into the stream of power His power. All you have to do is yield yourself to God, ask Him to take care of you. Ask Him to take care of those things in your life that are bigger than you, and you'll soon find yourself being lifted above all obstacles, all storms, all difficulties. Point 10 Miss Coleman experienced several notable milestones in her life before she even reached adulthood. Among them were leaving home in her teens to travel with her sister and brother-in-law in their tent ministry, and starting her own ministry one that would soon eclipse every healing ministry before and after in the entire 20th century. 2 Asterisk Sermon by Catherine Coleman, Correct Praying is Your Faith Being Voiced, Used by Permission of the Catherine Coleman Foundation, Pittsburgh, PA. 3 Asterisk Buckingham, Jamie. Catherine Coleman Daughter of Destiny, Plainfield, Bridge Logos International. Copyright 1976, p. 15. 4 Asterisk Sermon by Catherine Coleman. Knowing How to Have Power Over Difficulties, Used by Permission of the Catherine Coleman Foundation. 5 Asterisk Sermon by Catherine Coleman, Guidelines for Life's Greatest Virtue. Used by Permission of Catherine Coleman Foundation. Backslash 6 asterisk T his is according to her high school records, as birth certificates weren't required by Missouri until 1910. 7 asterisk obituary in the German Family Bible, January 28, 1907. 8 asterisk Hosier, P38 9 asterisk sermon by Catherine Coleman, knowing how to have power over difficult IES 10 asterisk Ibid Catherine Coleman on the porch of the family home in Concordia, Missouri early 1900s, Coleman family, early 1900s, brother Cooley, father Joseph, mother Emma, Catherine, sister Myrtle, Catherine Coleman and her father, early 1900s, chapter 3 defining moments paying the price is never a one-time experience. The first major defining moment in the life of Catherine Coleman came when she was 14 years old, she became a Christian. She told the story many times during in her life, of how she answered a sovereign wooing of the Holy Spirit. It was on a Sunday at noon when she accepted Jesus as her personal Savior. Her father was standing in the kitchen when she got home from church. She ran all the way home to tell him her news, just as she had run to tell him everything that happened to her all the years before. She rus head up to him and exclaimed breathlessly, Papa, Papa. Jesus has just come into my heart. Without emotion, he responded, Baby, I'm glad, I'm glad. 11 She was never quite certain whether he really understood what she meant or not. Even as a young teenager, Catherine Coleman had a mind of her own, for, when it came time for her to join a church, 
she chose her father's Baptist church rather than her mother's Methodist 1.12 in relaying the events of her conversion, Miss Coleman said, I was standing beside Mama, and the hands of the church clock were pointed to five minutes before 12 o'clock noon. I can't remember the minister's name or even one word of his sermon, but something happened to me. It's as real to me right now as it was then the most real thing that ever happened to me. As I stood there, I began shaking to the extent that I could no longer hold the hymnal, so I laid it on the pew, and sobbed. I was feeling the weight of, conviction, and I realized that I was a sinner. I felt like the meanest, lowest person in the whole world. Yet I was only a 14-year-old girl. Altar calls were never given in that little Methodist church. I had often seen them take in new church members, but this was much different for me. I did the only thing I knew to do, I slipped out from where I was standing and walked to the front pew and sat down in the corner of the pew and wept. Oh, how I wept. Then the recognition came over Catherine's young being that this was an occasion for joy. She said, I had become the happiest person in the whole world. The heavy weight had lifted. I experienced something that has never left me. I had been born again, and the Holy Spirit had done the very thing that Jesus said he would do John 16 8.13 during Catherine's childhood years in Concordia, attending church was as much a part of life as work. Her father was a Baptist and her mother a Methodist. But when Catherine accepted the Lord in the spring of 1921, it was while she was with her mother at a Methodist church. Point 14 However, as of 1922, the year Joseph was elected mayor of Concordia, the entire family were listed as members of the Baptist church, and when Emma Coleman died in 1958, her funeral was held in a Baptist church. Point 15 On several occasions during her sermons, Miss Coleman mentioned that her grandfather Walkenhorst was of the firm conviction that the only people who would ever make it to heaven would be Methodists. However, she also stated that her grandfather didn't know a thing about being born again. If Grandpa Walkenhorst did make it to heaven, she stated, dash and I'm not so sure he did but if he did, he got the shock of his life when he found some Baptists there. In the same service, she mentioned that her grandfather practically disowned her mother when she married a Baptist. Point 16 When Catherine was a teenager, her mother taught Epworth League meetings for young people at the Methodist Church. A neighbor of hers reported that Mrs. Coleman was an excellent Bible teacher, and Catherine and her sisters and brother must have received some very fine teaching and training at home. The neighbor also talked of hearing someone in the Coleman family singing in the evenings and someone playing the piano. Point 17 Yet, in spite of Emma Coleman being well-versed in the Bible and an excellent teacher, she was not born again until 1935, in one of Catherine Coleman's meetings in Denver, Colorado. The paradox was that her mother was a stern disciplinarian, yet she was more open to the urgings of the Holy Spirit, while her father was easygoing and permissive, yet he possessed a resistance to the Word of God and an aversion to preachers. Miss Coleman once said about her father's aversion to P. Reach E.R.S., Joe Coleman despised and hated preachers. In fact, she said that if he saw a preacher coming down the street, he would cross the street to keep from speaking to him. He thought all preachers were in it for the money. 18 The only time Joe Coleman attended church was on holidays or special services when young Catherine was giving a recital. As far as she knew, he never prayed or read the Bible. He died without ever hearing her preach. So, when her Denver Revival Tabernacle was established in February of 1935, Miss Coleman often invited her mother to attend services. After the close of the first meeting her mother attended, Catherine went into the prayer room behind the pulpit to pray for those who had answered the invitation. A few minutes later, her mother walked into the prayer room and told Catherine that she wanted to know Jesus as Catherine knew him. Catherine, now choked with tears, reached out and laid her hand on the back of her mama's head. The moment her fingers touched, mama began to shake, then cry. It was the same kind of shaking and crying that Catherine remembered when she had stood beside mama in that little Methodist church in Concordia. But this time there was something new. Mama lifted her head and began to speak, slowly at first, then more rapidly. But the words were not English, they were the clear, 
bell-tone sounds of the unknown tongue. Catherine fell to her knees beside her, weeping and laughing at the same time, when Emma opened her eyes, she reached out for Catherine and held her tightly. It was the first time that Catherine could ever remember being embraced by her mother. Her mother did not sleep for three days and two nights after that incident. She was a new person, Catherine said, and right up until her last breath of life on April 18, 1958, Emma Coleman had a wonderful, sweet communion with the Holy Spirit. Point 19 That experience must have brought some healing to Miss Coleman. However, she was concerned that her beloved father might not have been born again. At times, she would speak as if she had no question that he was with God, but privately she was known to have expressed frustration at not knowing for su relieving home another characteristic of those used greatly by God is their willingness to drop everything and follow his leading. On October 6, 1913, Catherine's older sister Myrtle married a young, good-looking evangelist named Everett Parrott. When Parrott completed his coursework at Moody Bible Institute, he and Myrtle started an evangelistic tent ministry. In 1923, when Catherine was 16, she and Myrtle persuaded their parents that it was God's will for her to travel with the Parrots on their tent circuit throughout Washington and Oregon. During that time, they had become acquainted with a well-known teacher and evangelist named Dr. Charles S. Price, who had a healing minis try and introduced them to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Almost from the beginning, the Parrots' marriage had not been happy, and the added strain of having young Catherine to provide for didn't help matters. It would have been easy for Catherine to sink into self-pity. Instead, in keeping with her strong work ethic, she took on washing clothes on Mondays, a household schedule she called her mother's religion, and ironing on Tuesdays. Ironing included the white starched shirts her brother-in-law wore to preach in, and the iron was one of those heavy old clunkers of that day, and had to first be heated over a wood or coal stove. Among the lessons Catherine was learning in those early days were patience, endurance, and not giving in to self-pity. Those virtues would serve her well in later years. Many of Catherine Coleman's sermons flowed from her spiritual growth. One story she told, of a woman whose ego and self-pity had ruined her life and the lives of those around her, illustrates the fact that Miss Coleman learned well that self-pity is a destroyer, her life was jammed up, and she brought it all on herself that awful self-centeredness. Had she pulled out that key log, of self-centeredness and self-pity, had she changed her center from herself to God, the whole thing would have been cleansed and released. That was one woman that no one ever heard say, I'm sorry. Be careful of the person, whether they're a member of your family, whether you work with them, whether they are an employee, be careful of a person who cannot say, I am sorry you will find that person very self-centered. As near as this woman came to it was to say one day, I'm sorry I did not take better care of my health. Even then, her repentance had a self-reference to it. She was clogged up. She had tied the hands of both God and man. God cannot help her. Her husband cannot help her. That is the reason you have heard me say ten thousand times that the only person Jesus cannot help, the only person for whom there is no forgiveness of sins is the person who will not say, I'm sorry for my sins, such a self-centered person usually draws disease to themselves like a magnet. Point 20 From the time she was a teenager, Miss Coleman was determined not to allow self-pity or self-centeredness to have any place in her life, no matter what happened to her. Her decision to act on the divine wisdom of God as he revealed it to her is what always enabled her to rise up to each new defining moment that shaped her. The price of the Holy Spirit Catherine Coleman's life showed that every Christian who studies the Bible and prays will have the principles of God revealed to them, just as they were revealed to her. She maintained that everyone could have the operation of the Holy Spirit in their lives in the same way she did, if they were only willing to pay the price. But paying the price is not a one-time experience. It begins with commitment and a determination to live a lifetime of paying the price in service of God. She once said, I'm completely dependent on the Holy Spirit. There is a place in Him, a death. But remember this, Catherine Coleman does not have one thing that God won't give you if you pay the price, it costs much, but it's worth the price.
it'll cost you everything, absolutely everything. Point 21 Part of the price for a spiritual walk that allows the Holy Spirit free reign in our life is the recognition of God's principles when they are brought to our attention, such as not allowing self-centeredness to operate in us and a decision to deal with it immediately if it tries to rear its head. The way to eliminate self-centeredness is found in the Lord's statements to the Pharisees concerning the two greatest C.O.M. and D.M.N.T.S., Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Matthew 22 in the charismatic movement, keeping those two commandments is referred to as walking in love. Catherine Coleman learned early in her life that self-centeredness, along with all the other self-sins, self-pity, self-indulgence and self-hatred judging and condemning oneself, greatly hinders the workings of the Holy Spirit. There were many other moments that defined Catherine Coleman's life, and other times and places where she could have chosen not to submit to the lessons to be learned through adversity, or to refuse to grow through correction from the Holy Spirit. Fortunately for the body of believers in Jesus Christ, she made the proper choices. Catherine Coleman's life proved that, like many other great leaders of the church in the past century, God chooses whom he will to raise up in a particular ministry. Great spiritual leaders are not made by man, but appointed by God, and are usually perfected through the struggles and storms about which Miss Coleman so often spoke. Great preachers such as Oral Roberts, Lester Sumrall, and Kenneth E. Hagin were raised from deathbeds and went through many storms and much persecution, and yet, like Catherine Coleman, their commitment to follow the call of God on their lives remained steadfast. 11 asterisk an hour with Catherine Coleman 12 asterisk Buckingham, P24. 13 asterisk Hosier, pages 3233. 14 asterisk her mother had been officially removed from membership after marrying Joseph Coleman, because he was a Baptist. 15 asterisk Scogan, Larry C., Catherine Coleman A. Biobibliography, Central Missouri State University, Warrensburg, Missouri. July 31, 1984. 16 asterisk an hour with Catherine Coleman, Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International, Washington, D.C. 17 asterisk Hosier, P44. 18 asterisk an hour with Catherine Coleman 19 asterisk Buckingham, pages 7071. 20 asterisk sermon by Catherine Coleman. Not doing what we like, but liking what we have to do used by permission of the Catherine Coleman Foundation. 21 asterisk Ibid late 1920s, Catherine Coleman, her sister Myrtle, and Myrtle's husband, Everett Parrott, Chapter 4 The Call of God My Heart is Fixed. I'll be loyal to him at any cost, at any price. Catherine Coleman never understood why God called her to the ministry. She felt there were millions of people better equipped for ministry. But God took the nothing that she offered up to him, and he turned it to his glory. In the days when Miss Coleman's ministry gained worldwide acclaim, most of her critics never had an opportunity to witness her humility and love. They misunderstood her unique delivery and personal style and made little effort to look beyond her mannerisms to the real person. Biographies and accounts from friends reveal that Miss Coleman's affectations were not a put on dash they were the real Catherine Coleman. Miss Coleman never accepted the labels that people were constantly attaching to her. She especially disliked being called a faith healer, about which she once commented, All I know is that I'm somebody who loves the Lord with all my heart, I resent being called that faith healer more than anything. I am just an ordinary person. I really don't know what I am other than just somebody who loves people and wants to try to help everybody that I can. I'm not a faith healer because I've never healed anyone. It's just the mercy of God. Yet she never doubted her calling. If everybody in the world told me that as a woman I have no right to preach the gospel, it would have no effect upon me whatsoever, because my call to the ministry was as definite as my conversion. Point 22 God's their choice and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy, Acts 2 18 KJV, 
Catherine Coleman referred to herself as God's handmaiden. To her, prophesy was telling the good news or preaching, not foretelling, which is the current meaning usually applied to the word. She stated many times that she did not believe she was God's first choice for the ministry he so richly blessed her with nor even his second or third choice. She believed that God had called some man to carry forth the work, but that man was unwilling to pay the price. However, she did step up and respond to God's call and was rewarded with the honor of inspiring and encouraging thousands of people to increase their faith in him, and watch the miracles flow. Laying the foundation the five years Catherine Coleman spent living with her sister and brother-in-law allowed her to lay a foundation for the future ministry God was preparing her for. During that time, she learned to alleviate any burden her presence as a member of the Parrot household might have brought. She spent countless hours reading and studying the Bible, and she was constantly in prayer and worship before God. In 1928, the Parrots and their tent ministry arrived in Boise, Idaho. Their marital problems had been escalating, however, so Everett packed up the tent and went to South Dakota, while Miss Coleman, Myrtle Parrot, and pianist Helen Gulliford 23 stayed in Boise to hold a meeting scheduled at the Women's Club. That was the beginning of Catherine Coleman's ministry. But after two weeks of daily meetings, the offerings weren't even enough to pay the rent on the building or on their small apartment, and they were reduced to living on bread and tuna. Point 24 Myrtle felt she had no choice but to rejoin her husband, and Helen had simply reached her limit with the life of itinerant ministry. Miss Coleman saw little future in continuing on with the parrots and their faltering ministry, so when a local pastor in Boise offered her a chance to preach in a small pool hall converted into a mission, she and Helen jumped at the opportunity, and that was the end of tent evangelism, and the beginning of Catherine Coleman Ministries. Fixed on the things of God from the Pool Hall mission, Miss Coleman went to Pocatello, Idaho, where she found a grungy opera house that had to be cleaned and repaired before she could preach in it. After Pocatello, she moved on to Twin Falls, Idaho. There, in the dead of winter, she slipped on a patch of ice and broke her leg. The doctor told her not to set her foot on the ground for two weeks, but she insisted on preaching in a cast, explaining that she didn't want her flesh to cause her to compromise her obedience to the will of God. She once said during a sermon, The things of God are real to me, I can never remember what folk call backsliding, or ever having the slightest desire to leave the things of God, or to ever stop preaching, or to take life a little easier. My heart is fixed, and when at the age of 14, I was born again in that little Methodist church in Concordia, Missouri, my heart became fixed on the things of God, and I've never compromised for one second. From that first sermon I preached in Idaho Zacchaeus up a tree, and God knows if anyone was up a tree, I sure was one thing I knew, I was sold on the things of God. Jesus was real to me. My heart was fixed. Point 25. One family with whom Miss Coleman lived in the early years of her ministry didn't have enough space for her, so they scrubbed out the turkey house in the backyard, and that's where she slept. She said that she would have slept on a stack of straw if necessary, because of the need to preach that had welled up inside of her. Other places where Catherine Coleman lived while she was in Idaho during the early 1930s may have been cleaner and more comfortable than that old turkey house but they weren't any warmer. Guest rooms were not heated in those days, and she would snuggle under a great pile of blankets until her bed was warm. Then she would turn over on her stomach and study the Bible for hours. If she felt that anyone who attended her meetings was not saved, she would announce that she was going to lock the doors and not let them out until they were. She was joking, of course, but she would stay at that altar until the wee hours of morning, praying with anyone in need. One of the secrets of Catherine Coleman's great success in ministry was that her heart was fixed on Jesus. She was sold out to the Lord, determined to be loyal to Him and never grieve the Holy Spirit under any circumstances. In those early years of ministry, two characteristics began to set like stone within Catherine Coleman, dedication to her ministry, and loyalty to God and His people. She grew personally and spiritually during those years, and always stayed true to her understanding of God's calling on her life. 
never catering to Christians only and never treating one person different than another, she invited all who needed God's healing touch to come into his presence at her meetings. She once commented, the nicest compliment that has been paid me for a long time was when someone wrote recently, and they had been in those early services when I was so very young, so very inexperienced, and said, I heard you recently from the Shrine Auditorium, and you haven't changed in your preaching one bit from the time I heard you as a teenager. You've never added any of the Rick brick, you've never changed in your theology, you've never gone off on tangents, you've never resorted to fanaticism. No, beloved. Why should I? I've had the greatest teacher a person can know, the Holy Spirit, without loyalty life simply falls to pieces. We've gotten to a place where there's so little of loyalty left. Loyalty to each other. Loyalty to what we believe. Loyalty to principles. Loyalty to the Lord Jesus Christ. That word loyalty has little meaning in these days because there's so little of it being practiced, loyalty is something that is intangible. It's like love. You can only understand it as you see it in action, love is something you do, and that's also true of loyalty. It means faithfulness. It means allegiance. It means devotion. It means so many, many th in gs. When we say we're loyal to God, we mean that we believe in his presence, we believe he is the creator, he is the sustainer, the redeemer of our lives. It means we determine to let this faith be the distinctive thing about our own lives as well our relationships with others, my heart is fixed. I'll be loyal to him at any cost, at any price. The waters have been deep, and I would not tell you there have not been temptations. I would deceive you if I told you it was an easy way or an easy life. But I also want you to know that I've never been disappointed in him, never once. Loyalty is much more than a casual interest in someone or something. It's a personal commitment. In the final analysis, it means, here I am. You can count on me. I won't fail you 26 as a result of her strong conviction on the importance of loyalty, Catherine Coleman commanded the same level of loyalty from those closest to her in her ministry, even long after her death. Faith in a big God after preaching across Idaho, Miss Coleman moved on to Pueblo, a small city in southern Colorado, where businessman Earl F. Hewitt joined her as her business manager. This marked her first non-tent, permanent location as a preacher. Following a six-month revival in Pueblo, she made her way north to Denver. The year was 1933. The Depression was in full swing. Businesses were closing down by the thousands. Millions of people were out of work and going hungry. Churches were struggling to keep their doors open. Traveling evangelists and itinerant preachers without denominational support were in even worse plights than ordinary churches. Yet, Miss Coleman's belief was fixed on a God whose resources were unlimited. Catherine Coleman always preached faith in a big God. She maintained that if we serve a God who is limited in finances, then we are serving the wrong God. Faith in a God big enough to cross any hurdle was a principle she not only preached, but she lived by. She instructed Earl Hewitt to go into Denver and carry on as if they had a million dollars. When he pointed out that in reality they only had five dollars, she responded, he's not limited to what we have or who we are. If he can use somebody like me to bring souls into the kingdom, he can certainly use our five dollars and multiply it just as easily as he multiplied the loaves and fishes for the people on the hillside. Now go on up to Denver. Find me the biggest building you can. Get the finest piano available for Helen. Fill the place up with chairs. Take out a big ad in the Denver Post and get spot announcements on all the radio stations. This is God's business, and we're going to do it God's way big. 27 Hewitt took her at her word, followed her instructions, and found a building that had been a Montgomery Ward Company warehouse. That summer, Radio KVOD began broadcasting her programs. The Denver meetings lasted for five months, during which time they moved into an even larger warehouse. People were hungry for the Word of God. Catherine Coleman's central message during those years was the message of salvation. Occasionally, 
even church pastors became born again at her altar invitations. Hers was a ministry of hope and of an unshakable faith in God that things would get better with the economy and the country. Her pianist, Helen Gulliford, formed a choir of 100 and composed much of the music they sang. People were attending by the hundreds. So when Catherine announced that the Denver meetings were finally over, there was an uproar. One man offered to make the down payment on a permanent building and erect a huge neon sign over it that would read, Prayer Changes Things. Miss Coleman accepted his offer and a building was located. Renovation began on February 25, 1935. On May 30 of that year, her Denver Revival Tabernacle opened with a huge sign over it as promised, Prayer Changes Things. Services were held every night except Monday. Tens of thousands attended over the next few years. Though it began as a revival center, the tabernacle soon developed into an independent church, with no denominational affiliation. Soon, there was a Sunday school. Special buses began operating, to bring people to the services. There were outreaches to prisons and retirement homes. Miss Coleman, who had been ordained as a Baptist minister under the Evangelical Church Alliance in Joliet, Illinois, during her years with the parrots, conducted weddings and funerals, and became, in effect, Pastor Catherine Coleman. And yet, right in the midst of this great time of new growth and incredible blessings from the Lord, Catherine Coleman was plunged into the greatest tragedy of her entire life. 22 Asterisk Hosier, pages 4546 23 asterisk a concert pianist who at one time had played for Dr. Charles Price's ministry. 24 asterisk all facts concerning those years are based on Buckingham's Daughter of Destiny, Chapter 111. 25 asterisk Catherine Coleman Sermon, Guidelines for Life's Greatest Virtue. 26 asterisk Catherine Coleman Sermon, Guidelines for Life's Greatest Virtue. 27 asterisk Buckingham, P57. Coleman's Denver Revival Tabernacle, giving a sermon, 1920s, during her radio broadcast on KVOD, Denver, 1930s, Chapter 5 The day Catherine Coleman died this was the first time the power of the risen, resurrected Christ came through to me. Three days after Christmas of 1934, Catherine Coleman received news that her father was struck by a car after falling on an icy street during a blinding snowstorm in Concordia, Missouri. Phone lines were down. It was hours before a friend could contact Miss Coleman in Denver to inform her that her father had drifted into a coma. She left for Concordia as soon as possible, driving through blizzard conditions from Denver across Kansas to Missouri. Just two days after the accident she reached Kansas City and called the family to let them know she was nearly home, only to be told that her father had died early that morning. In the early hours of the following day, she arrived home to find her father in a casket in the living room. Several mourners were keeping vigil. As she told the story to an interviewer more than 35 years later, an anger began to well up inside of her toward the youth who was driving the car that killed her beloved father, I had always been a happy person, she said, and Papa had helped to make me happy. Now he was gone, and in his place, I was battling unfamiliar strangers of fear and hate. I had the most perfect father a girl ever had. In my eyes, Papa could do no wrong. He was my ideal. He never spanked me. He never had to. All he had to do was get a certain look on his face. Mama wouldn't hesitate to punish me when I needed it. But Papa punished by letting me know I had hurt him and that hurt worse than any of my mother's spankings. 28 Her father never had an opportunity to hear her preach. Travel was expensive and time-consuming in the 1920s and 1930s, and Miss Coleman had been gone for more than 10 years with only a few visits home during that time. For a while after the accident, she spewed out venom about the tragedy to everyone she spoke with until the day of the funeral, sitting there in the front row of the little Baptist church, I still refused to accept my father's death. It couldn't be. My papa, so full of love for his baby, so tender and gentle, it couldn't be that he was gone. After the sermon, 
the townspeople left their pews and solemnly walked down the aisle to gaze one last time into the casket. Then they were gone. The church was empty except for the family and attendants. One by one, my family rose from their seats and filed by the coffin. Mama. My two sisters. My brother. Only I was left in the pew. The funeral director walked over and said, Catherine, would you like to see your father before I close the casket? Suddenly I was standing at the front of the church, looking down my eyes fixed not on Papa's face, but on his shoulder, that shoulder on which I had so often leaned. I remembered the last conversation we had had. We were in the backyard, he was standing beside the clothesline, reaching up with his hand on the wire. Baby, he said, when you were a little girl, remember how you used to snuggle your head on my shoulder and say, Papa, give me a nickel. I nodded, and you always did. Because it was what you asked for. But, baby, you could have asked for my last dollar, and I would have given you that too. I leaned over and gently put my hand on that shoulder in the casket. And as I did, something happened. All that my fingers caressed was a suit of clothes. Not just the black wool coat, but everything that box contained was simply something discarded, loved once, laid aside now. Papa wasn't there. This was the first time the power of the risen, resurrected Christ really came through to me. Suddenly I was no longer afraid of death, and as my fear disappeared, so did my hate. It was my first real healing experience. Papa wasn't dead. He was alive. There was no longer any need to fear or hate. Point 29 from that experience, Miss Coleman apparently felt that her father was with the Lord. Yet, she told an interviewer in 1973 that not knowing whether he was born again was one of the great frustrations of her life. Point 30 Catherine Coleman dated her understanding of death and her compassion for other people's sorrow and grief to that moment at her father's funeral, that was many years ago. Since then, I have been able to stand at the open grave with countless others and share the hope that lives in me. There have been mountaintops across those years, opportunities for travel and ministry and preaching. But, you know, growth has come not on the mountaintops but in the valleys. That was the first valley the deepest the one that meant most. 31 growth comes in the valleys although Catherine Coleman termed the death of her father her deepest valley, the next valley must have come a close second since it ended her ministry. In early 1937, among the evangelists, musicians, and preachers who were invited to speak at the Denver Revival Tabernacle was a Texas evangelist named Burroughs A. Waltrip, a handsome man eight years older than Miss Coleman. Waltrip, who was married and had two young sons, divorced his wife just 18 months after he met Miss Coleman in Denver. He presented himself as a single man even before his divorce was finalized. In Mason City, Iowa, he opened a revival center called Radio Chapel, from which he made daily broadcasts over a local radio station. Miss Coleman went to Mason City and helped Waltrip raise funds for his chapel. In 1938, Waltrip invited her to preach at Radio Chapel. They grew close and decided to marry. Helen Gulliford and other friends from Denver tried to talk Miss Coleman out of marrying the newly divorced evangelist, but she insisted that his wife had left him, which she felt freed him to marry. Catherine Coleman and Burroughs Waltrip were married in Mason City, Iowa, on October 18, 1938. Almost immediately, she sensed that she may have made a mistake. She confided to a friend that she wanted to undo the marriage but quickly decided to stick with her commitment. Not long after her wedding, however, the ministry that she had so conscientiously built up over the previous five years began to disintegrate. Her business manager bought out Miss Coleman's share of the building. Helen resigned from the ministry and went to help a smaller one in Denver. And soon, Catherine Coleman's flock was scattered. Miss Coleman spent the next eight years in ministerial oblivion, six in the marriage and the next two trying to find her way back to full-time ministry. Friends of hers who traveled to Mason City to visit her during the first few years of her marriage reported that she would sit on the platform behind her husband and weep while he preached. 
when word spread that Waltrip hadn't been entirely truthful about his previous marriage, people stopped attending Radio Chapel, and it soon closed. Waltrip allowed Miss Coleman to minister at a few bookings after that, but only in places where no one knew she was married. However, a series of her appearances in Portland, Oregon, were cancelled at the last moment, after the inviting pastor learned of her marriage to a divorced man. 32 in 1943, the couple moved to Los Angeles, where they rented an apartment. Things didn't improve, and in 1944 Miss Coleman made the most difficult decision of her life, to leave her husband. At that time, divorce was considered by many as a sin without forgiveness. The prevailing attitude was one of hostility toward divorced women, and Catherine Coleman was often subject to the wrath of the unforgiving. For the rest of her life, Miss Coleman frequently referred to the time she died as that time when she made the heartbreaking decision to give up on her failing marriage to a man she loved and to dedicate herself totally to God and His will for her life. On one of the rare occasions when she would talk about that period of her life, she said, I had to make a choice. Would I serve the man I loved, or the God I loved? I knew I could not serve God and live with Mr. She called him Mr. from the very first time she met him. No one will ever know the pain of dying like I know it, for I loved him more than I loved life itself. And for a time, I loved him even more than God. I finally told him I had to leave. God had never released me from that original call. Not only did I live with him, I had to live with my conscience, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit was almost unbearable. I was tired of trying to justify myself. 33 In one of Miss Coleman's final public appearances, a young man in the audience at a question and answer session after one of her talks asked her how she had met her death. This is how she responded it came through a great disappointment, a great disappointment, and I felt like my whole world had come to an end. You know, it's not what happens to you, it's what you do with that thing after it happens. And that goes back again to the will of the Lord. At that time, I felt that which had happened to me was the greatest tragedy of my life. I thought I could never rise again, never, never. No one will ever know if you've never died what I'm talking about. I can go to the place. It was a dead-end street. It was four o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. I felt I had come to a dead end in my life. You know, sometimes it's a thousand times easier to die physically than to keep on living, you see, the Lord forgives, but people don't, it would be much better if you would just take a gun, pull the trigger, and kill that one rather than to take the sword of the Spirit and this is what Christians will do. They use it, not for healing, they use it not in mercy, they use it not with compassion, but they take the word and use it as a sword. They'll drive it in, and 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 they'll drive it in. And they'll pierce your heart, and they'll pierce it clear through. It's much easier to die than to live. The end of that dead end street is when I died at four on a Saturday afternoon. Today. I feel it was a part of God's perfect will for my life. 34 In one of her books, Miss Coleman talked about that spiritual and emotional valley in her life. Today, I can take you down a dead end street in a certain town in a certain state where I surrendered everything to Jesus' body, soul, and spirit. As I walked there with tears streaming down my face, for the first time in my life, it was none of self and all of Him. When I made that full and complete surrender of everything to Jesus, the Holy Spirit took the empty vessel, and that's all that He asks. That day was the dawn of the greatest day of my life. I had no real ministry until I walked down that little dead-end road and surrendered everything to Him. But watch it, the greater the yieldedness, the greater will be the temptatio ns.35 From that moment on, Catherine Coleman never wavered from answering God's call on her life, never deviated from the path he set before her, and never saw Mr. again. She bought a one-way ticket to a meeting in Franklin, Pennsylvania, and took another step toward a destiny that would be remembered for generations to come. 28 Asterisk Hosier, P62, 60. 29 Asterisk Ibid, P6364. 30 Asterisk Buckingham, P6365. 
P64. 31 asterisk Hosier, P64. 32 asterisk Buckingham, Chapter V33 asterisk Ibid, P8834 asterisk Sermon by Catherine Coleman. Tehe Ministry of Healing, delivered at Melody Land, Anaheim, California. 35 asterisk Heart to Heart with Catherine Coleman, Bridge Logos, Copyright 1998, P59. Catherine Coleman's husband, Burroughs Waltrip, typical healing service, during a service at Keele Auditorium, St. Louis, 1975, Chapter 6 The first miracle I had the greatest teacher any human being has ever had, and that's the Holy Spirit. Franklin, Pennsylvania, is located in the northwest part of the state between Pittsburgh and Erie, in Pennsylvania's coal mining country. Among Pennsylvania's settlers were Germans, Polish, and Irish, which may have offered Miss Coleman a sense of heritage. She never explained why she picked Franklin to begin her comeback. Perhaps it was because they so fully accepted her there. More likely, however, is that it was simply God's divine plan for Catherine Coleman. From Franklin she went through the Midwestern states, and then south into the Virginias and Carolinas. She was accepted in many places. But in others, her divorcee status was exposed, and the resulting stigma caused the meetings to end. In those days, simply being divorced caused a woman to be looked down upon, and in many cases to be barred from many places and activities in society. In Columbus, Georgia, a newspaper got wind of the story concerning her marriage to a divorced man and they printed it. This was equally scandalous, and once again, she was on a bus back to Franklin. It was in 1946 that Catherine Coleman finally stepped out of the wilderness of her life and into the promised land of God's call for her true ministry. She asked the Lord, Oh, dear Jesus, why didn't you allow all this to happen to me when I was 16 years old? You see, I never got tired of body then, I didn't know what weariness of body really was, I could ride those buses all night and then preach all day. All I can remember is that I didn't need sleep at all. Why did you wait so long, dear Jesus? There wasn't an audible voice, I would tell you an untruth if I told you I heard an audible voice, but he did speak to me as definitely as though I could see his person and hear his voice, Catherine, had I given it to you then, you would have blown the whole thing. And I knew exactly what he meant. 36 Many ministries never get off the ground or they drop off the radar after making what looks like a great start, simply because the minister runs ahead of God. Some seem ready in their spirits to move as soon as they are called. Others need training and preparation time, to be seasoned through adversities and storms, as was Catherine Coleman. Beginning her real ministry Catherine Coleman's true ministry began in the 1,500-seat Gospel Tabernacle at Otter and 12th, in Franklin the same place where the great evangelist of a bygone era also began his climb to international acclaim, Billy Sunday. Soon after Catherine Coleman's tour of the South, she was invited to hold a series of meetings at the Gospel Tabernacle, and it almost seemed as if the previous eight years had never taken place. Her burden for lost souls had finally brought her to a place in the Spirit and in the Word where she could help affect lives for the Lord. She told a group in Washington, D.C., I can only tell you that with my conversion, there came this terrific burden for souls. When you think of Catherine Coleman, think only of someone who loves your soul, not somebody who is trying to build something only for the kingdom of God, that's all souls, souls, souls. Remember, I gave my life for the soul vision of lost souls. Nothing, nothing in the whole world is more important than that, lost souls. And with my conversion, there came this terrific burden for lost souls. If all the forces of hell defied me regarding my call to preach the gospel, it is as real to me as my conversion. It's something I've got to do if I have to stand on the street corner and do it. It's something I have to do if I have to live on bread and water. If ever you have been called of God to preach the gospel, you've got to. If your call is genuine, if your call is of the Holy Ghost, you'll preach it. I had an older sister, who heard, that her baby sister was preaching. She got so scared, 
I got this telegram from my older sister. She said, Catherine, be sure you've got your theology straight. And I didn't even know what theology was. I didn't know what she was talking about, but that burden for souls, that burden for souls. In the early years, salvation was, all I knew to preach. If the place had been filled with Christians, I still had to preach on being born again. It was all that I knew, but the love in it. I had the greatest teacher any human being has ever had, and that's the Holy Spirit. 37 in February of 1946, M. J. Maloney rented Miss Coleman the Gospel Tabernacle for her own meetings. Soon, she began daily radio broadcasts from WKRZ in Oil City, eight miles away. Within months, response mushroomed and she added a station in Pittsburgh. Suddenly, instead of people shunning her, she was inundated. She was so popular that the Oil City radio station had to bar visitors from the studio because the staff couldn't get its work done. The station was deluged with packages of nylon stockings sent to Miss Coleman after she mentioned on the air that she had a run in her last pair. World War II had just ended and many items were still scarce. This was a time when the Holy Spirit was restoring His anointing gift of healing to the body of Christ. The Great Healing Revival was in progress, with a number of ministers, including Oral Roberts, William Branham and Jack Coe traveling the country preaching on healing. Yet, Catherine Coleman had unanswered questions about divine healing. Through attending some of those healing meetings she learned things that would be well for ministers today to keep in mind, an overabundance of zeal always tends to be harmful. 38 at that time, Miss Coleman had been preaching primarily about salvation. But she began to ask people to come forward for the laying on of hands for healing, and she wanted to know more about this phenomenon of God. She attended some tent meetings of ministers who were preaching faith healing, having no idea that this was a ministry that would soon bring her international fame and help more people than she could ever imagine. A discovery of healing for years after the first manifestation of healing in her services, Catherine Coleman emphatically resisted being called a faith healer. Catherine Coleman is not a faith healer, she said. If you forget everything else you've ever heard about me, always remember, Catherine Coleman has never healed a human being 39 she was often asked when it was that she realized God had given her the ministry of healing. In the early part of my ministry, she would answer, I was greatly disturbed over much that I saw occurring in the field of divine healing. I was confused by the many methods that I saw employed. I was disgusted with the unwise performances that I witnessed, none of which I could associate in any way whatsoever with either the action of the Holy Spirit or the nature of God. And to this very day, there is nothing that is more repulsive to me than the lack of wisdom, and I'm putting it very mildly when I say lack of wisdom. There is one thing I cannot stand, and that is fanaticism the manifestations of the flesh that bring a reproach on something that is so marvelous, something that is so sacred. Forty in those early meetings, she witnessed things that made her heart ache. I knew how these people had struggled day after day trying desperately to obtain more faith, she said. And then when they were not healed, they were rebuked by the fact they had not had enough faith to be healed. Having been told that if they had sufficient faith, they would have been healed, I could see the defeat in their faces. I saw that because of their lack of knowledge, their lack of teaching, they were looking to themselves almost to the point where they were trying to heal themselves through their own striving rather than looking to the great physician 41 in describing her visit to such a meeting in Erie, Pennsylvania, she said, I began to weep. I could not stop. Those looks of despair and disappointment on the faces I had seen, when told that only their lack of faith was keeping them from God, were to haunt me for weeks. Was this the God of all mercy and great compassion? I left the tent, and with hot tears streaming down my face, I looked up and cried, They have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. 42 Miss Coleman spent several months pouring through the scriptures for the truth about divine healing. Her studies brought her a new kind of faith, when Jesus died on the cross and cried out, It is finished. He not only died for our sins, but for our diseases too, she told me. It took several months for me to realize that, 
for I had not been taught there was healing for the body in the redemption of Christ. But then I read in Isaiah where he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, and by his stripes we are healed Isaiah 53 5. I had no choice but to accept that Jesus did not die just to open the way to heaven, but to provide healing as well. I knew that if I lived and died and never saw a single healing miracle like the apostles experienced in the book of Acts, it would not change God's word, Catherine said. God said it. He made provision for it in our redemption at Calvary. And whether I ever saw it with my earthly eyes did not change the fact that it was so 43 Genesis of the healing ministry the moment Catherine Coleman understood that healing was available to all who believed was the moment she began to truly understand the relationship Christians must have with the Holy Spirit. In 1947, Miss Coleman began teaching a series on the Holy Spirit in her tabernacle meetings. Some of the things she said during the first night were revelations even to her. Later, she talked of being up all that night in her attic rooms at the Business Women's Club in intense prayer and study of the Word of God, overcome with excitement at this new revelation and anticipation of the mighty healing that the Holy Spirit can perform. The second night was the momentous occasion that people often read and talk about, the first time a testimony was given of someone being healed during a Catherine Coleman meeting. As a woman stood up and told of having been healed the night before, while Miss Coleman was preaching. Without the laying on of hands, without Catherine Coleman even being aware of what the Holy Spirit was doing, a woman was healed of a tumor. She had gone to her doctor that day after the meeting because she was so sure she was healed, and he indeed verified that the tumor was no longer there. Miss Coleman said about the incident, I listened as the little woman spoke. You were preaching on the Holy Spirit, she said telling us that in him lay the resurrection power I felt the power of God flow through my body. Although not a word had been spoken about healing the sick, I knew instantly and definitely that my body had been healed. So sure was I of this that I went to my doctor today and had my healing verified. The Holy Spirit then was the answer, an answer so profound that no human being can fathom the full extent of his depths and the full extent of his power, and yet, so simple that most folk miss it even today. I had my answer. I understood that night why there was no need for a healing line, why there is no healing virtue in a card, for a healing line, or a personality, no necessity for wild exhortations to have faith. That was the beginning of this healing ministry which God has given to me. Strange to some, because of the fact that hundreds have been healed just sitting quietly in the audience without any demonstration whatsoever. None. Very often not even a sermon is preached. There have been times when not even a song has been sung. No loud demonstration, no loud calling on God as though he were deaf, no screaming, no shouting. Within the very quietness of his presence, and there have been times, literally hundreds of times, when in a great miracle service there has been so much of the presence of the Holy Spirit that literally one could almost hear the beating, the rhythm of the heartbeat of thousands of people as their hearts did beat as 1.44 on the following Sunday came the second miracle, sitting in the service and hearing about the healing received by the woman with the tumor the week before caused 76-year-old George Orr of Butler, Pennsylvania, to ask God to heal his eye. And God did. The World War I veteran had been declared legally blind after an industrial accident 21 years earlier. Yet, 85% of the sight in his permanently impaired eye was restored. He had also been nearly blind in the other eye, and perfect eyesight was restored to that one. God began using, blessing, and prospering Catherine Coleman's ministry more than ever before. Once the healings and miracles began to take place, the crowds she was drawing to the tabernacle became even larger than those brought in by Billy Sunday. And it was then that the devil moved to attempt to abort the flow of the Holy Spirit. The attack came through M.J. Maloney and others on the board of trustees of the tabernacle. Maloney filed a lawsuit against Miss Coleman, alleging that she owed him a percentage of the funds coming into her ministry, Maloney wasn't just conducting a ministry, he was running a business, Maloney insisted his contract called for him to get a certain percentage of all the revenue including that which came through the radio ministry and the mail-outs. Catherine balked. 
somehow, it just didn't seem right. Maloney threatened to sue. The stage was set for a showdown. Point 45 The showdown included Maloney locking Catherine Coleman out of her building. A fight ensued between her followers, who were mostly coal miners, and Maloney's men. Her partisans broke off the padlocks and services continued. The clashes ended when Miss Coleman's people bought an old roller skating rink and opened a new tabernacle in nearby Sugar Creek. She named it Faith Temple. It was twice the size of Maloney's building, and it was packed from the very first S of ice. During this hectic period, Miss Coleman received word that Burroughs Waltrip had at last filed for divorce. The sheriff, who attended her meetings, served the papers to her privately, graciously refraining from notifying the media. In response, Miss Coleman sent the sheriff flowers every year on the anniversary of the event, for the rest of his life. It was seven years before reporters discovered that Catherine Coleman was a divorced woman. By that time, her ministry could not be stopped by old news. Services continued at the renovated roller rink and expanded to neighboring towns and then to Stamba Auditorium, in Youngstown, Ohio. The Holy Spirit was creating a juggernaut of a ministry through which he could accomplish great miracles, using someone he knew would not try to take credit for his deeds nor glory from his results. Build the kingdom, not the buildings Catherine Coleman's permanent move from Franklin to Pittsburgh came about as a result of her radio programs, which had drawn tens of thousands of listeners between 1946 and 1948, and expanded attendance at her meetings. From her very first tea miracle service at Carnegie Hall on July 4, 1948, a powerful expectancy of the miraculous was in operation. When the custodian told her that not even the biggest opera stars could fill the hall, she instructed him to set up enough chairs for a capacity house. She was right, the first service was in the afternoon, and Carnegie Hall was packed. She held another meeting that same evening also to a capacity crowd. It would be the same for the next 20 years. Though she rarely allowed her services to be filmed, photos of her services show a vast sea of people in attendance, numbering in the thousands. After her services began in Pittsburgh, her radio ministry expanded even more. People began urging her to move to Pittsburgh. She responded, the roof on Faith Temple in Sugar Creek will have to fall in before I'll move to Pittsburgh. Her unswerving loyalty to her Franklin staff, who had stood by her and supported her, inspired the same loyalty from them. They had taken her in and loved her when no one else wanted her. It would take an act of God to get her to move from Franklin to Pitts Burgh. On Thanksgiving Day, 1950, God acted, the temple roof indeed fell in, under the weight of the greatest snowfall in the area's history. Point 46 No one was harmed, but three weeks later she moved the ministry and bought a home in the Pittsburgh suburb of Fox Chapel, where she lived until her death. A growing legacy as the years passed, Catherine Coleman's ministry continued to expand. In 1965, after repeated invitations from Pastor Ralph Wilkerson of the Anaheim Christian Center, she held her first meeting in California, at the Pasadena Convention Center. Crowds became so huge that by her third service she outgrew the center and had to move to the larger Shrine Auditorium in downtown Los Angeles. Such was the foundation of Catherine Coleman's vast, worldwide ministry. It became so massive that it dwarfed the scope of her many international ministries, which were much less well known than her miracle services that drew so much public attention. During the Vietnam era, for example, her foundation donated hundreds of wheelchairs to war veterans. In 1970, she went to Vietnam and dedicated a mission chapel built by funds from her foundation, which built nearly two dozen other chapels for nationals in Central America, South America, India, Africa, Vietnam, Indonesia, Hong Kong, and Malay SIA. Some are called to build buildings, but not Catherine Coleman. In her messages in later years, she said that God did not call her to build a church her ministry was not to be merged with any one building. The Catherine Coleman Foundation financed more than 20 churches in foreign lands. Yet, Every single one of the church buildings she paid to have constructed were for other ministries, not her own. 
the fact that she did build churches was largely obscured by the publicity of her healing s of Isis. A simple calling many people called Catherine Coleman pastor out of love and respect for her. Although she did perform many of the functions of a pastor for a time, she was never set in the office of pastor, never truly pastored a church, and always claimed that she was not called to one of the fivefold offices. Instead, she walked in the simplicity of being a handmaiden of the Lord. For nearly three decades, from 1948 until 1976, Catherine Coleman's ministry continued to expand. All of the funds that came in went to the foundation, with the exception of her comparatively small salary of just $25,000 per year. She gave countless financial gifts to other ministries and organizations. A number of well-known ministers even had their first tailored assets bought for them by Catherine Coleman.47 Eventually, Miss Coleman's radio messages were broadcast in every state in the nation, and in many places overseas via shortwave radio. For more than eight years before her death, her weekly television program aired on CBS. It was the longest-running religious show in history at that time, with over 500 shows having aired, as well as the longest-running nationwide half-hour series the network had ever produced up to that time. She was truly a pioneer in Christian media ministries, setting the pattern for countless TV evangelists, pastors, and preachers to come. After 1968, Catherine Coleman's services in Pittsburgh were moved from Carnegie Hall to First Presbyterian Church, downtown. Her Monday night Bible studies were also held there and were attended by some of the most elite Bible scholars in Pittsburgh. For the last 10 years of her life, she held monthly services at the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles, and she spoke at large churches, conferences, and in several meetings of the Full Gospel Business Men's Fellowship International. Point 48 She knew who the leader was what allowed Catherine Coleman the stamina to keep going all those years, to maintain her increasing pace even as she grew older, and to fill her busy schedule in spite of an enlarged heart, was her dependency on the Holy Spirit. In her book, A Glimpse into Glory, she said, If one is being led, then that one follows. You ask how all these miracles come to pass. They come to pass because I follow the Holy Spirit. He leads, I follow. I die a thousand deaths before I ever walk out on the platform or the stage, because I know how ordinary I am. I know that I have nothing. I'm completely dependent on the Holy Spirit. People ask, is this not a thrilling experience? Being chosen by God for such a responsibility. No, not thrilling, but awesome. Sometimes so awesome I wish I had never been called, sometimes that responsibility is almost overwhelming. It isn't hard work. I can stand on a platform, the stage of some auditorium, for four and a half hours and never feel the weariness, because I am completely yielded to the Holy Spirit. But the burden of the responsibility drains the physical body, not only do I walk off a platform fully refreshed after a very long service, but I feel as if I could turn around and do it all over again. The secret of it is this, Catherine Coleman has nothing to do with it it is the Holy Spirit. An hour under the anointing of the Spirit enables me to walk off that stage more rested in the body and mind than when I first walked on the platform. There is infinite renewal for my own body as he fills this body with himself and his own spirit. Point 49 During the last five years of Catherine Coleman's life, a weariness began to overcome the anointing that usually renewed her body. Those final years also brought her more heartache, more stress, and more problems than the previous 25 combined. The enemy of her soul, that devil of old, seemed to be taking advantage of her increasing physical exhaustion, piling on stress and confusion, and harassing and hindering her more and more as her effectiveness in God's hands and her popularity with the masses increased around the globe. The only thing that kept her going full speed was her special relationship with her best friend, the Holy Spirit. But time was growing short. 36 asterisk Hosier, P49. 37 asterisk an hour with Catherine Coleman. 38 asterisk Ibid 39 asterisk sermon by Catherine Coleman. T he secret of all miracles in Jesus life. Used by permission of the Catherine Coleman Foundation. 
40 asterisk ibid 41 asterisk ibid 42 asterisk buckingham p101102 43 asterisk ibid 44 asterisk sermon by catherine coleman t he secret of all miracles in jesus life 45 asterisk buckingham p108 46 asterisk buckingham p118119 47 asterisk hosier p107 48 asterisk a layman's organization founded by demos shakarian 49 asterisk coleman catherine a glimpse into glory old tappan bridge logos copyright 1979 pages 116 5 3 4 126 typical coleman audience during a healing service during a service at keel auditorium st louis 1975 Chapter 7 Her best friend he knows that I will be true to him as long as my heart keeps beating. Certainly, other people over the past two millennia have had as close a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit as Catherine Coleman did. Her relationship with him was as unique as the other varied aspects of her incredible ministry. Such a relationship is possible for any believer who is willing to pay the price she paid but few are willing to give up everything in exchange for such a relationship. Catherine Coleman referred to the Holy Spirit as her best friend, and called him her only teacher the greatest teacher in the whole world, as she put it. How does a person develop that intimate of a relationship with the Holy Spirit? By moving into that fellowship in the same way Miss Coleman did, there was a growing process, she stated. There was a time of learning, a time of schooling oh, not in some seminary nor some university the greatest teacher in the whole world is the Holy Spirit. Believe me, you'll get your theology straight when the Holy Spirit is your teacher. I studied my Bible, oh, how hungry I was for the Word of God, 50 she had begun seeking the Holy Spirit when she was just a young girl. I shall never forget those holiness camp meetings in Oskaloosa, Iowa. Oh, that's been years and years ago. They may still have those holiness camp meetings. I don't know. I only attended years ago right after I became a Christian, and before I knew anything about the Holy Spirit. All I knew was that I had been born again. Jesus had forgiven my sins. I can remember that old-fashioned tabernacle, see the dust on the ground. Maybe I'm talking to someone who has attended one of those holiness camp meetings. I was so hungry for more, and every time an altar call was given, whether it was after the morning session, the afternoon session, or night, there was a red-headed, freckle-faced teenage girl who was the first to walk down the aisle and kneel in that sawdust, crying, crying, seeking holiness. Seeking some experience, I knew not what. After one of those morning services, that red-headed, freckle-faced girl would rush to the altar, head buried in arms, weeping and crying. When the noon hour came, everyone else would leave, but she was still there. She would still be there when the afternoon service began. She was the first at the altar when the call was given again. I never found what I was seeking there. I was that girl. I was seeking for some experience, some ecstasy. It was years later that I found out that Jesus is our holiness, and one who has the most of his holiness is the one who has the most of Jess US.51 She dated her close relationship with the Holy Spirit to one afternoon in Los Angeles when she died. Four o'clock that Saturday afternoon, having come to the place in my life where I surrendered everything, I knew nothing about the fullness of the Holy Spirit. I knew nothing about speaking in an unknown tongue. I knew nothing about the deeper truths of the word. In that moment with the tears streaming down my face, looking up and bowing, to the Lord, he and I made each other promises. There's some things you don't talk about, it's like some things that are so personal between a husband and a wife. You just do not display them out in public. He knows that I will be true to him as long as my old heart will keep beating, and I know that I'll be true to Christ. We have a pact. It was all settled at the end of a dead-end street. And in that moment when I yielded to him, body, soul, and spirit, when I gave him everything, all there was of me, I knew then, beloved, what that scripture means, 
If any man will follow me, let him take up his cross, a paraphrase of Matthew 16:24. The cross is always the sign, the symbol of death. That afternoon Catherine Coleman died, if you've never had that death to the flesh, you don't know what I'm talking about, when you are completely filled with the Holy Spirit, when you have had that experience as they had in the upper room, there will be a crucifying of the flesh. There will be a death to the flesh, believe me, there are lots of professing Christians, professing to have been filled with the Holy Spirit, who have never died to the flesh. All he needs is somebody who will die, and when I died, he came in. I was baptized. I was filled with the Spirit. I spoke in an unknown tongue as he took every part of me. In that moment, I surrendered unto him all there was of me, everything. Everything. Then, for the first time I realized what it meant to have power. Point 52 She often spoke of the responsibility of being entrusted by the Holy Spirit with the administration of his gifts, particularly with the kind of ministry she had. She trembled at the thought of grieving him. She knew that he is a literal person, and that the only way to be used by him was to follow him. Trust brings responsibility many times in her messages, Miss Coleman warned Christians not to try to use the Holy Spirit, but only to let him lead them. His power, as he essayed, is under his S.O.L.E. authority, not ours. She insisted that a Christian can be yielded enough to the Holy Spirit until there is